having finished the explanation of the jhanas, we now come to insight knowledges. That's the translation most often used for vipassana, insight knowledges. And we have already spoken about several steps, particularly first two steps of insight. And because we're now coming to the third step of insight, it is also the appropriate moment to have a look at dependent origination, which this picture behind me illustrates. I'll first explain why this is the appropriate moment, and then I'll explain the picture. The first two aspects, which we have already had, as far as insight goes, were that we are able to distinguish between mind and body. We know that there are two, and that although they're interdependent, they have separate functions. And we can actually experience that quite easily. And the first, second step that we became aware of has been anicca, the arising and ceasing of the meditation subject, of the mind that is actually watching the meditation subject, also arising and ceasing, all our thoughts, all our feelings, body, all of that coming and going. The third step is called cause and condition. And the, or sometimes it's also called the knowledge of cause and condition, which makes it a little more um, explicit. And in this third step, we come to what is called dependent rising or dependent origination. Now, I'll first read you what it says as the next step after the jhanas in this discourse, inside knowledge. When the mind of the meditator is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. Imper imperturbability. He directs and inclines it to knowledge and vision. Now, the first part of the sentence tells of the mind in the jhanas. It's pure because it doesn't have any hindrances at the time. It's bright because it isn't disturbed by anything. So it's unblemished, has no defects. And it's malleable and wieldy because it is expandable. It doesn't just stay with the ordinary kind of mind <coughs> condition that we have usually, but it expands. So it's malleable, wieldy, it is steady, it has to be steady, and it's not perturbed, which is easier to say. It has no perturbance in it at all. So at that time, having finished with the jhanas, or wherever, at whatever stage of jhanas we finish, that is the time to direct and incline the mind to knowledge and vision, which is insight. Now, knowledge and vision means understood experience. The vision is the experience. It's not a vision which has to be in pictures. It's the inner experience. The word vision in English is a little bit um, um, difficult to understand because the word means that we see something, but we don't necessarily see a picture. We see something within us. And seeing something within us is that experience. And the knowledge of it is understanding it. So 
after the jhanas is the best time for insight. Here it is uh, explained. And then it says, and the meditator understands, this is my body having material form composed of the four primary elements originating from father and mother, built up out of rice and gruel, or potato and vegetables, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion, and this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. So, this is one part of insight knowledge, that after the jhanas, it is seen that body and mind, both of them, have causes and conditions which bring them about. So in the case of the body, the four primary elements are mentioned, which we have already talked about several times, and I've already asked you to use it as a meditation subject. Originating from conception and being constantly built up out of our food. Without that, it would already vanish without the food. Here it's called rice and gruel. Well, whatever food we're taking in, it doesn't matter. Bread and butter. It's impermanent, obviously. We've already looked at that. And the word subject to rubbing and pressing means that when there is sickness, this was two of the things like massaging, helping to get rid of some sickness through that, and trying to um, help the body in that way, and to dissolution and dispersion, so it di dissolves at death, and then it disperses. It's uh, dust, back to dust, as we all know, and some of us are quite agreeable to that, and some are not. That's that, that is that, that, that way. But this is an, a matter of looking at the causes and conditions for the bod body to be there and the conditions that this body has to endure and has to go through. And then the consciousness is supported by the body and it is bound up with it. It is uh, intertwined with it, of course. And we will see in a minute how we can look at the causes and conditions for that too. And then the Buddha gives a, um, a simile. Great king, suppose there were a beautiful gem of purest water, eight facets, well cut, clear, limpid, flawless, endowed with all excellent qualities, and through it there would run a blue, yellow, red, white or brown thread. A man with keen sight, taking it in his hand, would reflect upon it thus. This is a beautiful gem of purest water. It's flawless and well cut, endowed with all excellent qualities, and running through it is a colored thread. In the same way, great king, when the mind of the meditator is thus concentrated, pure and bright, one directs and inclines it to knowledge and vision and understands, this is my body having material form. This is my consciousness supported by it. This too, great king, is a visible fruit of the spiritual life, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. What we see here is that the insight, is, which is in this case meant to be a perfect insight, is considered to be more excellent and sublime than the previous jhanas. So the jhanas being the means for gaining that kind of insight. Now this um, um, simile, the gem is the body and the keen sight that this man has who looks at it is the insight and the um, taking it in his hand is uh, the uh, the person is the meditator with keen sight, taking it in hand. And so he sees this 
color, color thread, and that's the inside knowledge. So just which means that at that time the mind is so clear and so bright and so pure that it can see this fact of conditioned arising so clearly as if it was a colored thread running through a pure gem which a person with good eyes can see easily. It is no longer an assumption or it's not, not a theory, but it's a seeing. And at that time, this seeing then becomes pure insight. And therefore it is excellent and sublime. Now, interestingly enough, that's all that's said about insight in this whole sutta. But it isn't going to be all that we're going to find out about insight. Because there's a lot to insight. I just wanted to read that to you and that this little book here I'll just mention it to you it's called The Seven Stages of Purification it's an English translation of my teacher's book in Singhalese and um, although it refers to a different discourse it refers to the Ratta Vinita Sutta. It has the insight knowledges in detail. So we'll use that because of the fact that it is well detailed and we can go through every step and get these insight knowledges quite clear in the mind, first of all. So what we hear here is that we first, we are interested at this point in the cause and condition for mind and body arising. Now, this is, here it's called the knowledge of discerning cause and condition. To gain freedom, I'll just read you what it says in here, to gain freedom from all doubts concerning the nature and pattern of existence, it is necessary to understand the law of cause and effect clearly revealed to the world by the Buddha. The understanding is called the knowledge of discerning cause and condition. And with the maturing of this knowledge, the purification by overcoming doubt is brought to completion. So, doubt is in this case, the meaning of this is vacillating between rec thinking this is me and this is not me. It's neither. It's neither me nor not me. But that's the doubt. It's no longer the doubt in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, nor is it the doubt in the benefit of meditation or the ability to do it. It's none of those doubts, which were the skeptical doubt of the fifth hindrance. This is a, the vacillation of the mind between is this me or is it not me? I'm supposed to learn about the not me, so what is this now? So this difficulty is, um, of course, for the mind uh, uh, upsetting because it can't have a clarity on it. Even though it may have already um, agreed to, okay, it's not me, well, that too isn't right. So it also doesn't help. There has to be more. There has to be more insight. And because of that, it says that at this point, we have to see cause and effect. This knowledge of discerning cause and condition is also known as knowledge of things as they are, right vision, or knowledge of relatedness of phenomena. And here the Buddha gives a, a simile how to understand cause and condition. Just as dependent on whatever condition a fire burns it comes to be reckoned in terms of that condition that is to say a fire that burns dependent on logs is reckoned as a log fire one that dependent on faggots is reckoned as a faggot fire one dependent on grass is reckoned as a grass fire and a fire that burns depend on cow dung is reckoned as a cow dung fire 
not something that we use a lot, but anyway, that's what used to be used. A fire that burns depend on rubbish is reckoned as a rubbish fire. And even so, consciousness is reckoned by the condition depend on which it arises. A consciousness arising depend on I and forms is reckoned as an I consciousness, this I, not the me. A consciousness arising depend on ear and sounds is reckoned as an ear consciousness. Consciousness arising depend on nose and smells is reckoned as nose consciousness. Consciousness arising depend on tongue and flavor is reckoned as tongue consciousness. Consciousness of reckoned, sorry, consciousness arising depend on body and tangibles reckoned as body consciousness. And consciousness arising depend on mind and ideas is reckoned as mind consciousness. What the Buddha is trying to tell us here is that there's no abstract consciousness. Consciousness is always dependent on something. There is nothing that doesn't have cause and therefore is an effect. And because everything is cause and effect, it all has conditions on which it has to depend. And because no condition is dependable, that is the underlying dukkha of existence. Everything that we are has to depend upon a condition. Well, this body has to be depend on the condition that there's food. Otherwise, it's going to disappear. It also has to depend on the condition that it remains healthy. So these conditions are not dependable. And only when we see that one day, that these conditions are not really something that we can rely on and that are desirable, will we be ready to leave the conditioned behind. And Nibbana is called the unconditioned. So this is why the Buddha is saying this. Everything depends upon a condition. And here our consciousness depends upon our sense contact, right? Well, we have several times already discussed sense contact, so we know what that means. That there is the I and the I object, and when the two meet, we have I consciousness, and then seeing starts. And the same with all the other senses. He has just said, thus the meditator understands that I consciousness arises because of the I and the visual object and that owing to the eye contact, there arise feeling, perception, volition, and thought. Now, these are the khandas. And we'll see about that in a minute. That, that is... Um, now, here's another condition that we need to know. The first condition is this one that we need to know, that the body arises out of food and out of having been conceived, and that the consciousness, which is only briefly mentioned here, which is bound up with the body, it was said, arises out of the sense contact. Now, the second thing is that we need to know, and it's written like this, A meditator clearly understands the three phases of the round of becom becoming, the cycle of defilements, cycle of action, and the cycle of results. The cycle of defilements includes the defiling tendencies of the mind, such as ignorance, craving, speculative views, and grasping. The cycle of action is a functional aspect of those defilements, that is, the mass of actions, both wholesome and unwholesome. And the cycle of results consists in the pleasant and the painful results of those actions. Now this says nothing else except karma. That's all it's talking about. It's talking about the fact that we have defilements, which are ignorance, which means that we haven't given up the me. That's all this ignorance means. It means ignoring Nibbana. Craving speculative views, it could be this way or that way, and hanging on, grasping. And in, 
because of that we have the functional aspect action we make karma and we get results so that too is a cause and condition we need to know we need to know and we have to actually investigate that whether we can see how we are making karma in fact we are making karma every moment when we are thinking talking acting it can be good or bad if it isn't clear if it isn't insightful if it isn't loving and helpful it's bad karma and we don't have to talk to make bad karma we can do it silently all we have to do is think it and one of the things that we can very easily recognize is that making bad karma stops our meditation effectively having thought anything that's negative meditation doesn't happen having any thought anything that's positive can be a great help so there we have our defilements we have the action in the thought and we have the result now that of course is not only happening for meditation we can check that out for other things in our lives we can check out where we have made bad karma where it has had results if we can see it we can see where we have made good karma and where it has results we need to see that with discernment so that it becomes an obvious and always practiced pathway of making good karma particularly in our thoughts if we are not careful um, harmless if we are not considering others it's already bad karma a lack of consideration for others is already bad karma and it's very often due to ignorance and ignorance unfortunately is bad karma ignorance is not excused in any manner or form because one doesn't know is not a reason why there won't be any result how we think of when one is speeding and the uh, cop flags one down and says hey you're doing 80 in a 40 mile zone and you say oh officer i didn't see the sign i had no idea you're going to get a ticket or not i'm sure <laughs> so ignorance does not prevent one from the result one's got to be right there with it and all of that is cause and condition now that too has the implication of danger and that too needs to be seen that we are constantly in danger of making bad karma and getting the bad results and with that we will more and more get an idea quite solidly that there's no percentage in being in this world over and over again that doesn't mean that we now commit suicide or anything like that that would be the greatest foolishness there is because we wouldn't get out at all we'd be right back but what it would mean is that we become aware of the urgency some vega of the practice 
bad karma is always a danger. So that's another insight, which we have to all get ourselves. As the Buddha is only the show of the way, he does show these things as being necessary for our insight, but if we don't feel it within us, it remains the Buddha's Dhamma and doesn't become our own. We've got to feel it within. So that's another cause and condition. So consciousness, which is what we're aware of, is caused by sense contact and body is caused by conception and food. These are causes and conditions which we have to know in order to recognize the danger inherent in all of these causes and conditions. Right. I'll go to the, um, to the picture now and explain something about the picture. I presume you've had a bit of a look at it in the meantime. The cycle of birth and death, it's called, the wheel of samsara. And it was actually initiated by the Buddha himself. The story says that he was walking with his monks one day and was teaching them Dhamma and took a stick and drew this circle in the sand and started explaining it. And the monks were so fascinated by that that they asked permission to make a drawing of that, copy that. And the Buddha said, yes, they should make a drawing. And he said, and hang it on the inside of, every, of the door of every monastery and designate one of the monks to learn all about it and explain it to visitors, which was particularly important in those days because not everybody was literate and could read and not everybody had a chance to come and listen to the Buddha. But people do, did li visit and still do monasteries and temples, and this was then done, was on the inside of every monastery door. With the invasion of the Muslims into India in the 7th century, all the monasteries were demolished, and not a single one of those pictures has remained. However, before this was all destroyed, the uh, knowledge of this picture was taken to Tibet. And so today, this kind of uh, picture comes to us from the Tibetan artists. And it is obviously far more elaborate and more artistic because at, in those days, as the Buddha drew it in the sand, it would have been very simple. But being artistic and, and uh, elaborate and colorful, it also makes a very nice wall hanging. So it does uh, serve two purposes. But it is meant as a teaching device. And a teaching device which um, touches the eye is, of course, very effective because a picture says more than a thousand words so what we have there is on top we have this demon demon who has the circle of life birth and death in so to say in his claws now that demon is anicca impermanence and he tries to dress himself up to look pretty and uh, I presume I haven't looked at it <laughs> I presume he has um, five skulls on top one, two, three, four, five, yes to have a decoration on top these are five skulls the five aggregates the five aggregates which we think we are and which are depicted as skulls which has 
two meanings, which means in one case that he's trying to look him, make himself look pretty. Anicca, this impermanence, is, uh, looks quite pretty. We don't usually, if we haven't got, happened to have a meditation retreat, we hardly ever think of it. But if it hits us, then we think it's a tragedy. So these are the five aggregates. And then he usually has also some bracelets. Maybe I should sit sideways, make sure that he has them. Huh? I can't see any bracelets, but he has some, yes, he has some bracelets at his feet and has a nice uh, tiger tail. So he's supposed to look beautiful, but of course he doesn't. He looks ferocious and uh, he eats everything up. Anicca eats everything up. And then we have several um, circles. We have an inner circle, a small inner circle. And there are three animals in that inner circle. They build a circle themselves because they um, grab each other's tail. And what we have is a pig, a cock, and a snake. And the snake is hate because she has this poison in her, poisonous fangs. And the cock is greed, because he has a whole barnyard full of hens, which is our strongest greed anyway. And then the pig is ignorance, because it roots around in the dirt and throws dirt over its face, and then can't look out at all, can't see anything. So these three are always in the middle. <clears throat> that other one, black and white one, does is not common. I, can't, I don't know what's in it. <laughs> I presume it's another aspect of hell, yes. Where is that? Well, this black and white next one, circle here, is a, a special idea of this particular artist. And uh, it does show the different realms, but it's better shown on the big one. So we'll have a, we'll, have, we'll use the big one. The, uh, I think I have mentioned the uh, 31 realms of existence, have I? Yes. Okay. There are, on, the, on this uh, wheel of birth and death, they're usually depicted as six. One, two, three, that's right, six. And one of them is the human realm. And the human realm usually shows some human activities. I can't see that far, so I better have a look where the human realm is. <laughs> Hmm. Well, it doesn't look like uh, San Francisco at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose that would be the human realm. There are three people eating. One is in, a mother in bed with a little baby, and uh, one is uh, feeding some birds. There's an old man. And a sick man, yes, there's an old man, a sick man, and maybe even a meditator, and uh, quite a, oh yes, and one on a horse. Yes, so this is the human realm here, this one over here. And in each one of these realms, we can also see that there's a Buddha there. So, which also means that from each realm, we can go to the enlightenment uh, state. So this is the, the human realm. Then we have the hungry ghosts. That's right next to it here. It's actually the animals should be next to it, but they're over here. Every artist does this sort of thing the way they like it, the way they think it looks going to look pretty. This they'll have to do according to the teaching, the outer realm and the inner one, but the middle one they can do the way they like it. So here we have the hungry ghosts. This is a realm which uh, is inhabited by beings that have been so greedy in their life that 
they come into a realm where they have very tiny throats and huge stomachs and so they are always hungry and can never get enough because they can only take in very little. But actually next to the human realm should be first the animal realm and so we have a, a realm here which um, has different animals, uh, fish and uh, elephant, tiger, horse, all sorts of little rabbit, uh, deer, all sorts of things. And there's also a Buddha there. So that is uh, the idea that one can also go to enlightenment principle, although that is not mentioned in the Buddha's discourses like that. Usually the Buddhas are up here not in the realms themselves. So then, from the animal realm, the, uh, the next realm are the realms of the Asuras, and that's this one here. I would say, yes, that's this one here, the Asuras. That's a fighting realm. They're always fighting with each other. Um, they are like warriors, and uh, it's, um, they're devas, but they've fallen below because they're constantly fighting. So that's the Asura realm, and usually they're depicted black and white, but they're not in this case. But there are two factions of them, so they're having a war. And then come the hungry ghosts, and then comes the hell realm, which I presume is at the bottom, yes. Hell realm's at the bottom, and there's fire going, and then there's all sorts of horrible things happening there happening here. Doesn't look so terrible. Oh yes, there's some horrible demons there that are going to kill some people and they have some tortures and killing people in the hell realm. And then up on top that would be the Deva realm. Now the Deva realm has many different uh, stages. It goes from number six to number 31 but it's always depicted as just one realm because there isn't enough room on these uh, posters, to, on these pictures to make so many different realms. So the Deva realm, again, according to the um, artist, this is uh, very often a tree where you can pluck off any fruit that you want, uh, whatever you like you can get off this tree. It's a wish-fulfilling tree. And, uh, in that, in that, there's beautiful music and lovely colors, and uh, it's uh, supposed to be a realm of uh, great delight. So these are the six different realms. So you can see from the human realm downward, each one of the realms is shown, but then the Deva realm is only shown as one, because, well, one doesn't know so exactly what it's like although the Buddha has described them in some detail. They're not in exact detail, but he has described them in some detail, how they become more and more subtle. And they are, as I've told you already, I think, consciousness states. And then we come to this, which is the cause and effect. This is called the 12-point depend, the depend origination. And it has 12 parts to it. And depend origination means cause and effect. And it just fits very well with what, with our next stage of insight, which we need to get. So it starts out up here, but you could start anywhere actually, because it is a circle. So we could start anywhere. But usually in explaining it, we one does start here, which is ignorance. Now, I don't think you can see that far, but what it is, it's a blind person trying to find their way. Usually, what you see is a blind old woman with a stick in a forest. Here, I can't actually recognize it very well, but it's supposed to be a blind person. Uh, that's our ignorance. And the word ignorance means a specific thing. Not only that we are ignoring the Four Noble Truths, Dukkha, its causes, the total liberation from Dukkha, and the way to that total liberation, but that we are ignoring absolute reality, where everything is just 
moving all the time and there is no real person in it. So ignorance doesn't mean that we can't read nor write or anything like that. It just means those two specific things. Ignoring the Four Noble Truths. Having the delusion of me. And the next one is a potter. And usually we see nice pots and broken pots. And that's our karma making. Because we are ignoring the fact that we are really only a phenomena and not a person, an individual, a personality, an entity, a separate, a separate thing, we are making karma. And some of it will be good and some of it will be bad. There's no way that an unenlightened person will not make bad karma. So we need to know that too, that that's a dangerous thing, as I said already. But it comes only, karma making only happens because we think it's me doing all that. As long, as soon as there is no such thing as me doing anything, there's no karma anymore. So with making this, this is karma formations, with making karma formation comes the rebirth consciousness. The rebirth consciousness is a, depicted as a monkey and usually as a monkey that goes from tree to tree. This particular artist has made things a bit difficult because it's all different from what it usually is. This monkey is sitting in a cage. But usually it's a monkey going from tree to tree and it means rebirth after rebirth after rebirth after rebirth. Because of the fact that we're making karma and have not given up the meat illusion, we come back. We have rebirth consciousness. Rebirth consciousness is the thread that connects us from last life to this life. Now we can look at this whole thing as three lives, we can also look at it as one life. I will explain that in a minute. Now with the rebirth consciousness, which has now appeared, what we get are mind and body. And mind and body are depicted quite rightly here as um, a person rowing a boat and another person lying prone in that boat. The one that's lying prone in the boat is the body. And the one who is rowing the boat is the mind. The mind's doing everything that needs to be done and the body has to go along with all that. So we've got mind and body. Now having mind and body, we have the six senses, which should be a house with five windows and a door. Unfortunately, our artist only made a house. He forgot the windows and the door. <laughs> so the five windows, obviously, are five senses, and the door, the mind, the thinking process. So all of this, having started from ignorance, is automatic. There's nothing we can do. Ignorance makes us make karma, even if it's good karma. And we have the rebirth consciousness, we get mind and body, and we get the six senses. Now the next picture, yes, it's the same, it shows man and woman embracing. And what that, from the, this five, six senses, what happens is we get contact. We make contact. Now here we have touch contact. Man and woman embracing. Whatever con sense contact, right? All the five senses. Well, here's one of them is depicted because it's the easiest one to depict, touch contact. It's also the easiest one to know, touch contact, feeling, perception, mental formation very important to recognize the connection. Now with that sense contact having been made, feeling arises. And the picture is usually a person that is having arrows thrown into their eyes, which is happening here too, which is extremely unpleasant feeling. 
three kinds, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. This one has very unpleasant feelings from a touch contact. The arrows are touching and so it's very unpleasant feeling. Now, we still have no way out. All of this is automatic. But now we come to the doorway. This is a doorway. And this is the only doorway there is here to get out. Now we have other doorways in other explanations, but in this one, this is it. After the unpleasant feeling comes the craving. Now in this case, obviously, if you get arrows thrown into your eyes, the craving would be to get rid of that. But the picture which is shown is usually a man eating. This is a moment where we can do something. If something has a pleasant feeling, not to want to have it and to keep it, and if it's unpleasant, not to react to it, to want to get rid of it. Now, obviously, in the case of arrows being thrown into one's eyes, it would be very difficult. It's an enormously uh, extreme situation. But we don't have those extreme situations during the day, but we have one situation after another where we can check out quite clearly whether we are reacting in any manner or form to a feeling which we've had. And that we, then we know what makes us be here as human beings and probably, unfortunately, have to come again. So this is our doorway. No reaction. Now, if those of you who've done the uh, sweeping with me know that that is one of the aspects that we can learn through the sweeping technique, whatever feeling or whatever emotion arises, no reaction. But first we have to have the feeling and then no reaction because we haven't got a feeling then no reaction doesn't apply. So this is the doorway here from between feeling and craving. Having gone past that, having had the feeling and having either disliked it because it wasn't nice or liked it a lot because it was so nice, then we're on our way again, namely to clinging. And clinging is shown as a person plucking fruit off a tree into baskets which are full to overflowing anyway. Plucking, 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 there's so much food lying all over the place but still doing it, clinging. The minute there is craving, either, either kind, of wanting to have or wanting to get rid of. At that moment is clinging. The two always go together. And having come to, to that part of clinging, the next thing is the becoming. And what is shown here is a man and a woman in bed together, which is how we get conceived. So there's conception taking place, which is becoming. And as this becoming, from that comes birth. So we have a lady with a baby, birth. And the next one is death. Where there's birth, there has to be death. And what is shown is uh, a cremation ground and a man with a bundle of bones over his back, which he's taking to the cremation ground and burn them there. So from birth then comes death. And usually, well not in this one, but there's often written, and this is how this whole mass of dukkha arises. Now, we can say that this is one life. Ignorance, karma, rebirth consciousness. Then this life. We have mind and body, senses, Sense contact, feeling, craving, clinging, and new becoming, next life. So we have three lives, new becoming, birth and death. Or we can say it's all in one. It's all this life. We have ignorance, so we're making karma. So every morning we wake up with that same ignorance. 
It's always me. It's always me making karma. It's always me wanting something or me not wanting something. Always me being in charge of whatever it is that I can be in charge of. So this then, because of that, mind and body and the senses operating during the day and having all these sense contacts that we constantly have, getting constant feelings because of them, whether we're aware of them or not, and then liking, disliking, wanting to have, wanting to get rid of, and because of that clinging, and because of the clinging, the whole thing over and over again. We can say that one day is one whole life, or the becoming is exactly the next step. It all starts all over again from the becoming. The birth of the ignorance is again happening, and again the karma making. So because we do not stop at this point, we have a constant new becoming. This is an important, or I should say a... Um, <coughs> essential teaching of the Buddha, it also contains in it the Four Noble Truths. Because the first Noble Truth is Dukkha and the second one is the cause of Dukkha is craving. So craving, which is here, our step beyond the doorway, is again the cause for the new Dukkha. So because the Four Noble Truths are considered to be the hub of the wheel of Dhamma and where the enlightenment understanding of the Buddha, the dependent origination, is the elaboration on that. One can, of course, elaborate much more on that. And the Buddha said, Who understands dependent origination understands the Dhamma? Who understands the Dhamma understands dependent origination. And one time, Ananda, who was his uh, cousin and also his attendant for 25 years, said to the Buddha, Oh, dependent origination is so profound and so clear, and I understand it. And the Buddha said, Do not say so, Ananda. Um, it is much too profound, because then he went into the explanation of it. And the Buddha explained the pen origination in many different suttas, different discourses, sometimes like this, sometimes in other ways. And then there is another dependent origination, which is, this is the worldly dependent origination, the mundane one. And then there is another one, which is the transcendent dependent origination, the Kutra Paticca Samuppada, and that one shows a clear pathway from Dukkha to Nibbana. And they are the inside steps, first the jhanas and then the inside steps. Whereas this shows us how we are operating as ordinary human beings the transcendental dependent arising shows us how we're operating as meditators. Here, we have very little chance. It's almost impossible to stop that uh, reaction. It's uh, so quick and so instinctive. But as meditators, we have a very good chance. And the transcendental dependent arising, which goes from dukkha to faith and confidence when hearing the Dhamma, to joy about the path, to the eight jhanas, and then to the insight steps, which I will be explaining one after another, shows how we can get out of this constant, Re reoccurrence of the same thing. But first we have to want to get out. And for that we have to really know whether it's worthwhile being in it. And whether we have seen enough of the dukkha, that or of the anicca, they're both the same actually, 
because everything is dukkha because it's anicca. Um, that depends upon our ability to gain insight on oursel- uh, by ourselves. The two things which are mentioned in order to see cause and condition particularly well is for the body the elements and for the mind the aggregates. So both are meditation methods and to see them as the causes and then we have this condition that we're in. Now these causes are totally impersonal, aren't they? So where does the person arise? It is a very important question to ask oneself where in between the cause and the result between that where did the person arise in there? Where was it? How did there get to be a me in the middle of that? because causes have results no matter what we do about them they always do so how did we get that in the middle of it so the elements for the body and the aggregates the four aggregates particularly for the mind this should not ever be a speculation but always needs to be a reality when we see it Only then does it have any impact. So if we just sort of think about it, that's not enough. We have to actually experience that in the meditation or in the contemplation on it, how this is an impersonal conglomeration of bits and pieces come together and then we say it's me and if they don't come together properly it all falls apart so we are relying on a totally unreliable condition now when one does see that quite clearly what happens is that one becomes very much aware of the danger in all that so substituting the unwholesome with the wholesome becomes automatic we no longer have to try it or try to remember it but it has become a part of one's mental makeup to substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome over and over again now it is also possible that at this time when the impersonality of this whole body-mind complex is seen that there's more fear than usual and that needs to be examined it's very important fear is a very important aspect because fear is a human condition as long as we're not enlightened there's fear that we're going to be annihilated of course there's nobody there that can be annihilated but that is only that we don't know because we don't have we have that delusion so the fear of annihilation is always there now fear of annihilation shows itself in different ways and this is this at this point fear needs to be investigated it shows itself in fear for one's life naturally if there's a life-threatening situation we have fear for our life but it also shows itself in the annihilation of the ego if we don't get ego support if we are not praised loved appreciated if the ego support is not there if our emotions are not supported then there's fear that we're going to be that the ego is going to feel small and ugly 
and we'd rather like to have it feel nice and big and important. So this is not a situation to be blamed, this is a situation to be recognized. What we can't recognize, we cannot rectify. We can only (coughs) get rid of the mistakes that we make when we know that they're mistakes. As long as we think that they're okay, we won't change it. So fear shows itself in fear for the body and fear for the ego um, delusion which we have. And because it is a delusion, it needs a constant support system. Only if we can minimize it a little, eliminate it a little, this ego, then we can get away with um, letting go of the support system for a little while, which means that we can actually meditate. Because the ego support system disappears the minute we stop thinking. So as we are able to let go a little bit, we can actually become concentrated. The the less we become concentrated, the more we're looking for the ego support system. The ego support system has to be constant because it's a delusion. Now, we don't have to go around here and say, this is a house, this is a house, this is a window, this is a window, this is a window. Uh, this is the ceiling, this is the ceiling, this is the ceiling. It's totally unnecessary, it's all there, we know it. But the ego, we can't find it, it's nowhere. So we've got to have constant support for it. So until we have got the skill for letting it go and becoming concentrated in meditation, we're going to keep on thinking. And also, the more of a support system we need, the more fear we have that it's going to be upset, somebody's going to upset the apple cart, Um, somebody's not going to really uh, help us to feel this ego be okay, because they might not agree with us, they might totally disagree with what we're doing or what we're saying or what we're thinking or don't think we're beautiful or think we're uh, desirable or whatever it is that we'd like to be, or clever. Or so the, the fear at this point, when we see that we are just causes and conditions, but haven't really been able to let go of any of that yet, can arise quite strongly and can be a very useful and a a useful emotion to be investigated because we will find no doubt that this is exactly what it is that the ego is uh, crying for support and uh, sometimes it's actually crying for support and the more we want it supported the less chance we have of getting rid of it and it's the public and private enemy number one. It's the only one that makes life difficult. There's nobody else that can do it. It's always that. So this is one part that arises at this time, can arise, doesn't have to, a little stronger. And anything that we can do to investigate fear at this time is very useful. Impermanence of whatever we look at is a great helpmate because what is it that we need to support so much we can't even describe it what is the ego we can't touch it we can't see it we can't describe it we can't have it we can't keep it we are constantly trying to make something out of it so impermanence is the antidote for this fear and the, uh, of course, the causes and conditions, the understanding how the body has come, 
how our miseries arise through craving and how the mind operates with the four aggregates and where is this me in those things where is it in the body that's easier to see that it's not there but it can remain a theoretical approach it's got to be for real that we see this body as nothing but bits and pieces or having conditions to support it and where in the mind do we find the me and this is the the third step of insight knowledge of discerning cause and effect and an extremely important one a person who gets that completely uh, understood felt is called a small stream entra chula satapana it doesn't even um, have the connotation being able to really ex- experience nibbana but it is a small stream entra because the inside is so clear that at that time the view of self already changes it was a very important step and it overcomes the doubt am I or am I not both questions are wrongly put neither am I nor am I not because it's all a delusion all right any questions sort of see if I can sum up what I got from what you said to see if I got it straight. Upon finishing the jhanas, one should examine the body and the mind in terms of the causes and conditions, particularly in terms of the body arising from the elements, what we eat, Uh, the fact that it experiences sickness and decays and so forth, and the mind as it arises from the aggregates. Actually, the mind as it arises from its first cause, which is the sense consciousness. Okay, from the sense consciousness. And that the insight comes from understanding the causes and their effects but that's what is to be looked at. The insight comes from the fact that we see that there is nothing else except cause and effect. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's very important. Okay. All right? Right. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Anything else? All quite clear or totally muddled, huh? What is it? Clear or not? No. Okay, well then ask. Not even clear enough to ask, huh? (laughs) Don't you repeat your statement on insight comes from seeing... I cannot repeat a sentence I've said. You'll have to ask me what is what it's about. What, what does insight come from? Where does insight come what from? What does insight come from? You just said a very clear sentence, and I got a piece of it, and then I lost it. To to Lee? Did oh, I say yeah. that sentence to Lee? You, you as, said as to me. Yeah. I said. That the insight comes from seeing cause and effect. Right. You said the insight right. okay. comes from seeing, seeing that, that there's, there's nothing, nothing else. Nothing but else. Okay. Cause and effect. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Carol. That's all you can do. 
Oh yes, that's all you can do. If you can follow me intellectually, that's all you can do. But then you'll have to also remember it. And as you remember it, then you'll have to practice it. And then something else happens. Then you can get the feeling for it. I cannot provide you with the feeling of impermanence, but I can tell you where to look to find impermanence. Right? It's like I have a very small degree of insight, and those parts of what you've said are all are lit up. But that's like such a small area. I, I it's like I know the difference between the the real um, awareness of what you're saying and just the roadmap, which is all I'm you know, which is all I'm getting. I guess I find it very frustrating. There's so much to know. <laughs> um, <no> yeah. <laughs> you know, there there isn't that much to know. I mean, no. you don't have to know all this. I only I only did that because it happened to fit in, and because I thought it was uh, uh, interesting. You know, and you can later on look at it again and see if you know if you remember it. Uh, you don't have to know all that. Um, I have to know it because I'm the teacher. So that's all. No. There's a lot to practice. A lot to practice. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But basically, what, we, what you practice is two things, calm and insight. In order to get calm, you do the jhanas, to the best of your ability, whatever, right? And for insight, you look at anicca, dukkha, anatta, either one of the three or all three, it doesn't matter. Impermanence, dukkha, and substancelessness. And in order to see one of those three, mm -hmm. we need to look at the causes and conditions that brought us about in order to see anatta. We, in order to see anicca, we have to look at the m constant movement of thought and feeling and body. And in order to see dukkha, we have to see whether our cravings, which are constantly there, really bring satisfaction. That's it in a nutshell. But seeing we're here for 30 days, I have to be a little more elaborate. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Michael. Um, I've been having a lot of um, like nightmares. Nightmares? At like night? Dream, dreams with, um, with a lot of fear in them. Really? Which normally, normally I can't remember my dreams at all, but it's been mm. really intense in the last mm. few days. Um, and I've heard, I've heard of this sort of thing before. Sure. Is it, is it somehow related to this fear, that, like the ego trying to defend itself? Yes, it has that in it too. Um, the ego knows that it's uh, endangered. The more insight you get, the more endangered it is. So it is going to try everything it can to k keep its uh, prominence and its authority and dominance. So whatever it can do in order to give you a bad time, it will do that. And um, also you can remember your dreams because the mind, because of the meditation, becomes clearer. And you have the, the clarity makes you remember. And also I often in meditation courses, people have far more dreams than they have otherwise. It's um, because there isn't that much release uh, through the mind as we have in daily living. The mind wants to spit out the stuff at night. So it is a, quite a common thing that people have more dreams. But the fearful thing can very well be related to having, uh, to feel the ego feeling endangered. It feels threatened. And as it feels threatened, it's going to really try to keep its place. Yes. We were in the kitchen with two great big pots full of lots and lots of 
really fake, um, like really gucky, dirty stuff, and you were helping to clean them off. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> we had a, in a German Buddhist magazine, there was a lovely little article about the ego and the ego and the meditator. Now I ca I wonder if I can remember the main points of it. It was so lovely. I photocopied it, put it in a frame and hung it up in my center in Germany. It was that good. It said that ever since uh, the owner of the ego had started meditating, there'd been nothing but trouble. Because they would, they would walk along a meadow and then they would discuss, is it the ego seeing the meadow or is it the meditator seeing the meadow, meadow? and they could never agree on anything. And then it got even worse because the meditator was telling the ego that the ego was just a delusion. And the ego was, was getting quite upset about that and decided it was going to show the meditator that it was not a delusion. It was going to get up on its hind legs and be real. And uh, so every time there was that talk about being a delusion, the ego did something to show that it was there. And then in the end it said, but uh, one thing it would like to tell all the other egos, to be very much um, afraid of Buddhist monks and nuns, not to get too near them. <laughs> was really nice. <laughs> yes. In this whole scheme of things, does the ego fall under mental formations? Yes. It's a Yes. Very elaborate. Yes. Persistent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantasy. It's Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> or Michael in Wonderland. Or <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a mental formation. But you see, all sense contacts, which is the thinking, is also a sense contact produce feeling. And therefore, having thought me for so long, we feel me. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Have a look into your heart and see whether you find any negativity such as dislike, fear, worry, anxiety, resistance, rejection. wanting if you find anything like that or any other feeling that's disturbing let it float away like a black cloud in the sky that floats away in the wind and then see the clear, bright, empty expanse of your heart and fill it with love to the brim.
and now give that love to anyone whom you find very lovable. Give it as your gift to that person. And now think of anyone who might really want some love from you and fill that person from head to toe with your love. Let your heart full of love flow out to that person. Think of anyone whom you believe does not get much loving. And fill that person with your heart full of love. giving the gift of your warmth and care to that person. Now think of anyone whom you don't find very lovable. And allow your heart to reach out to that person too. Filling and surrounding him or her with your heart full of love. giving this great gift of love.
think of the people that you know and meet often but for whom you have very little feeling if any let your heart full of love flow out to them too the more love we give the more we have Fill them with the warmth and the care from your heart, making this heart connection Now let the love from your heart flow out like a golden stream touching other people's hearts near and far. Imagine where people can be found and make your heart connection with as many as you can. Think of all the different creatures that we can see. Even around here, birds, ants, dogs, cats, spiders. all the creatures you can think of. Give them your love. Make a heart connection with them. They're part of our life. And then see the trees, the bushes, the flowers, the grass, all of that 
that nature has bestowed on us which is part of our life our framework give it all your love hug it appreciate it feel caring for it rivers, the hills, the mountains, the lakes, the desert, they'll all be part of your heart connection. (laughs) 